Greetings, viewer. Don't forget to visit my website for links to support the production of these works if you value what I'm doing. I appreciate any help you can offer. Thank you for having a look and a listen. Yours, John Loth. Recorded, edited, and produced by John Loth. The Evolution of Civilizations by Carol Quigley Chapter 3 Groups, Societies, and Civilizations The social sciences are usually concerned with groups of persons rather than with individual persons. The behavior of individuals being free is unpredictable. There is more hope of success when we deal with the activities of aggregates of persons because in such aggregates the unpredictable behaviors of individuals tend to cancel each other out and become submerged in the behavior of the group as a whole. While the behavior of such a group may not be predictable, it is less free to change and can, accordingly, be extrapolated in a way that individual behavior does not allow. The same situation exists in the physical sciences, where we are quite unable to predict the behavior of any individual molecule or particle, but can, with assurance, predict the changes that take place in any large aggregate of molecules. These relationships in the physical sciences can be stated in the form of laws concerning the pressure, volume, size, state and temperature of aggregates of molecules. With aggregates of persons, we can state no laws comparable to those found in the physical sciences, although we can point out tendencies. For example, if an aggregate of persons in a stable group undergoes a rise in standards of living, we can expect a tendency toward an increase in population for the group as a whole even when we cannot say of any individual in the group that he will have more children, or even any children at all. Moreover, we can study the nature and distribution of the increased supply of wealth to determine its effects on the numbers of children in various subgroups within the main group. But in the social sciences, where we must be satisfied with tendencies rather than with laws. We can analyze the working out of such influences and tendencies only if we have a fairly clear idea of the nature and structure of the social groupings involved. This is quite different from the natural sciences, where laws about the behavior of aggregates could be made long before men had any clear idea of how such aggregates were made up. The statement that we can enunciate rules of social tendencies only if we have fairly clear ideas about the nature of social groupings makes it necessary for us to confess that the nature of groups is one of the matters on which there has been wide disagreement in the past. In general, men's ideas on this subject could be placed in three classes. One those who believed that social groups were merely collections. Two, those who believed that social groups were organisms. And three, those who denied that social groups were either collections or organisms, but argued that they were sui generis, a particular kind of aggregate of their own. The distinctions between these three points of view on the nature of social aggregates could be expressed roughly as follows. A collection is no more than the sum of its parts, and the parts are interchangeable within the collection. An organism is more than the sum of its parts, since they have patterns of relationships, and the parts, being fitted to their position and role in the whole, are not interchangeable. The third class made up of those who maintain that a social group is sui generis, occupy a middle ground between the collectionists and the organicists, 
since they say that the whole is more than the sum of its parts, but that the parts, that is, the individuals in the group, are interchangeable in their functions and positions. A discussion such as this about the nature of social groups may seem to be a merely academic dispute of little practical significance, but as a matter of fact, it has been profoundly significant throughout human history. Those who have seen human groups as organisms, from the ancient Greeks to Hitler, have derived from this point of view certain corollaries about the relations of the individual to the group that have been destructive of individualism and of human liberties. For in an organism, the parts exist for the sake of the whole and are subordinate to it. They must be sacrificed if necessary for the welfare of the whole. Thus Aristotle says that a man cannot live apart from the state, as an animal could, or a god could, because a man cut off from the state is like a thumb cut off from a hand. It is no longer a thumb, but merely looks like a thumb. In saying this, he is using an organic analogy which explains the totalitarian character of the Greek polis, or of the later Roman imperium. Both were as prepared to sacrifice the individual to the state as we would be to cut off a cancerous thumb in order to save the whole organism. On the other hand, the argument that a social group is only a collection and thus simply an aggregate of individuals with no established patterns of relationships and with no aims or purposes beyond those of the individuals who make it up is equally pernicious of human values. For a collection can have no established traditions or any purposes of its own and can expect no spirit of sacrifice or of public service from its members. Instead, it must expect its members to be as competitive in their relations with one another as they would be toward any member of an outside group. The middle ground that regards a social group as an aggregate of its own distinctive type avoids the difficulties both of totalitarian organicism and of the rampant individualism of the collectionists. Because of their belief that the whole has pattern and thus is more than a mere aggregation of individuals, holders of the middle ground are able to preserve social tradition and to encourage devotion to the whole as an entity with its own distinctive values. But by their insistence that individuals are interchangeable within the whole, they are able to protect the ultimate value of the individual and to infer that the whole exists for the sake of the individual and not the opposite, providing him with opportunities to develop his higher potentialities through social cooperation in a way that would not be possible in a mere collection of individuals. From centuries of argument on these matters, there has begun to emerge a sufficient consensus for us to say that students of the social sciences today tend to avoid either of the extreme positions of organicism or individualism, and tend to agree that social groups are aggregates of a special kind, subject to their own rules and characteristics. Accordingly, we must seek to define a social group and to show the various types of these that can exist. There are three basic types of such social aggregates. 1. Social groups. 2. Societies. And 3. Civilizations. A social group is an aggregate of persons who have had relationships with one another long enough for these to have become customary and for them to come to regard themselves as a unit with well-defined limits. The essential thing about a group is that its members can say who is in it and who is not. The term covers such aggregates as a class in history, a football team, a fraternity, a university, a business concern, a parish or church, a political party, or a state. 
All these groups come into existence gradually, as relationships are established and mutual recognition grows. When a class in history or a football squad assembles for the first time, it is not a group, but simply an aggregate of persons, and the group comes into existence only gradually. In fact, it continues to develop as long as it is of any social significance. A society is a group whose members have more relationships with one another than they do with outsiders. As a result, a society forms an integrative unity and is comprehensible. It is the vehicle of the culture we were talking about before. A society has a culture because it is a unity, and it is a unity because its members have more relationships with one another than with outsiders. A group does not have any culture of its own. The culture of a group is the culture of the society in which the group is. By some stretching of the use of words, the personalities of the members of a group might be regarded as the culture of the group. But culture consists of more than personalities, since it also includes external culture. And the personalities of any group have more relationships with people who are outside the group than with people inside the group, if for no other reason than the fact that these personalities developed by means of relationships with outsiders long before these personalities joined the group. If this were not true, and the personalities of the members of the group had been developed by means of relationships within the group, then this aggregate of which we are speaking is a society and not a group. It is sometimes difficult for some people to distinguish between a group and a society because they fail to see the most fundamental relationships among people. It is frequently helpful to think of some of the varied relationships that can exist among people. If this is done, it becomes clear that the Zuni Indians or the Japanese, about 1850, were societies, but that a history class, a football team, or a corporation is a group. The Zuni or the Japanese were societies because they had their religious, intellectual, social, economic, and political relations with other members of the same group. The members of a class, of a football team, or of a corporation have most of these relationships with outsiders. Members of such a group have their religious relationships with the whole Christian tradition, while their intellectual relationships are with the whole tradition of Western culture. Their social relationships are with outsiders to the group, such as parents, sweethearts, or friends. Their economic relationships are with the whole capitalist economic world and beyond. For example, they drink coffee for breakfast, and their political relationships are with all their fellow citizens and even outside that. In such a wide-flung nexus of relationships, the relatively narrow range of mutual relationships possessed by members of the same class, the same team, or the same corporation shows clearly that these latter are groups and not societies. The real problem in distinguishing between groups and societies arises when we look at modern political units like the state or nation. Most states, such as Canada, France, Italy, Cuba, or the United States, are not societies, but groups because their members, relationships with one another, are only political and social, while their religious, intellectual, and economic relationships are in a much wider context. The religious ideas of people in the countries mentioned are expressed in terms of monotheism, the Christian ethical and doctrinal systems, the deity as a masculine being located in the sky, and so forth. There is nothing specifically Canadian, French, or American in these ideas. On the other hand, 
they are quite different from the religious ideas of peoples in a different society. These latter might be expressed in terms of a female deity residing within the earth, or of a non-human shape, or demanding human sacrifice, and so on. Similarly, the eating patterns of peoples in all the countries mentioned are very similar. They cook their food, eat bread made from wheat, drink coffee, prefer steaks, and are rather unlikely to be found eating raw blubber or fried locusts. Similarly, they all trace family descent through the father, practice monogamy, have private property, seek profits, accept the scientific tradition, use explosives as weapons, and so on. These similarities are so much more numerous and so much more important than the dissimilarities between these countries that the personality patterns and the general outlook on the universe that bind these people together into a single system of relationships makes them have more relationships with one another across political frontiers than they do with members of any single group within such frontiers. The fact that Canadians have more relationships outside Canada than inside it means that Canada could not be understood or even described without using terms like Christian, scientific, industrial, monogamous, nationalism, Protestant, capitalism, parliament, democracy, railroads, rifles, ballots, radioactivity, and such. None of these terms, nor the things which they represent, is of Canadian origin, nor can they be understood in purely Canadian terms. The need to use them in describing Canada means that Canada can be understood only as a part of the larger system from which these words and the objects they represent arise. This large system is, as we shall see, Western civilization. Canada can only be understood as a political group within Western culture. This distinction between groups and societies, with the former defined as an aggregate whose members have more relationships with outsiders than with one another, means that a society is a comprehensible unit, while a group is not a comprehensible unit. A group can be known, but it cannot be comprehended, because comprehension involves knowledge of a major part of the relationships existing in an aggregate. Such knowledge is not possible within a group because many of the relationships of the members of a group go outside the group to members of the larger unit, the society of which the group is a part. If a man from Mars, who knew nothing of our customs, but who could, in some mysterious fashion, communicate with us, were suddenly to appear in the midst of a social group, among a football squad at practice, or in the middle of a church service, or in a classroom during a lecture, he would find it utterly impossible to comprehend what was going on from explanations, no matter how detailed, of the interrelationships of the members of that group. His most obvious questions, what are these persons doing? Why do they do it? What do they eat? Where does this clothing come from? What happens when one of them dies? or any other of an endless variety of questions, could not be answered except by reference to persons, objects, ideas, or customs outside the group itself. Indeed, it is a safe rule that no significant questions about anything inside a group can be answered except by reference to things outside the group. On the other hand, when a stranger suddenly arrives in a different society, as R. F. Fortune arrived among the Dobu, B. Melanowinski among the Trobriand Islanders, Captain Cook among the Polynesians, Pizarro among the Incans, or Marco Polo 
among the Chinese. It is possible to obtain explanations and understanding of what is going on if there are communication and sufficient time. Thus, such a society is a comprehensible aggregate. While no social group is comprehensible, using that adjective in its real meaning as referring to something that can be grasped together. Since a society is comprehensible while a group is not, most political units, being groups, are not comprehensible units. Political units are comprehensible only when a single political unit covers the whole of a society. This is frequently not the case, although it is usually true of the more primitive societies organized in tribes. The Zuni, for example, like many of the other Indian tribes, were both a political unit and a society. Japan and China were, about 1850, comprehensible political units because they were separate societies. In most advanced societies, it will be found that the religious, intellectual, social, economic, and even military patterns are roughly coterminous with each other and with the outline of the society as a whole. But in such a society, the political units usually cut across these other patterns. We can know a great deal about such political units, but we cannot understand them, because understanding requires knowledge of a major portion of the patterns of relationships in society as a whole. As we examine numerous societies, like that of the Eskimos, the Zuni Indians, the Chinese, the Hotentots, or our own Western civilization, we see that there are two different kinds of such societies. A. Parasitic societies and B. Producing societies. The former are those which live from hunting, fishing, or merely gleaning. By their economic activities, they do not increase, but rather decrease, the amount of wealth in the world. The second kind of societies, producing societies, live by agriculture and pastoral activities. By these activities, they seek to increase the amount of wealth in the world. As we shall see later, the distinction between these two kinds of societies is of most fundamental importance. Man was a parasite from his first appearance on the earth, perhaps as long as a million years ago. Only with the discovery of the techniques of agriculture and domestication less than 10,000 years ago did it become possible for man to be a producer, and even during the last 10,000 years there have been more parasitic societies, like the Sioux or the Eskimos, than there have been producing societies, like the Zuni or the Chinese. If we concentrate our attention on the producing societies that have existed during the last 10,000 years, we see again that there are at least two distinct kinds. There are simple producing societies, like the Zuni, with agriculture, or the Maasai, with pastoral herds. And there are much more complex societies that we call civilizations, like the Chinese, the Aztecs, or ourselves. The distinction between a civilization and an ordinary producing society is not easy to draw, and it is too early in our discussion to seek to draw it at this time. However, it is clear that most of the civilizations with which we are familiar have had both writing and city life. Accordingly, as a temporary definition, we might say that a civilization is a producing society that has writing and city life. We might sum up our definitions to this point by saying that aggregates of persons may be divided into a. Collections b. Groups or c. Societies. The members of a collection, coming casually together in time and place, have no established relationships, 
the members of a group do have relationships sufficiently established to be able to identify who is or who is not a member of the group. But they have the major portion of their total relationships with persons who are not members of the group. A society, on the other hand, is made up of persons who have the major part of their relationships with one another. It may be either parasitic or producing, and if it is a producing society, it may or may not be a civilization. These rather simple but very significant distinctions can be summed up in a table. Aggregates of persons A. Collections B. Groups C. Societies 1. Parasitic societies 2. Producing societies A. Simple tribes or bands B. Civilizations When we examine these three kinds of societies, parasitic, producing, and civilizations, we see that there have been very many parasitic societies, a much smaller number of producing societies, and very few civilizations. As for the relative number of each, we might say that there have been hundreds of thousands of the first, at least thousands of the second, but not more than two dozen civilizations. Since our chief concern in this book is with our own society, which is a civilization, the rest of this book will be concerned with the nature of this particular kind of society only. Of the two dozen civilizations, all of which existed during the last 10,000 years, seven have been alive in recent years, while the rest, amounting to approximately 17 in number, lived and died long ago. All of them, both living and dead, can be divided into three groups depending upon the carbohydrate plant they produced as an energy food. There were three such foods, maize, that is corn, rice and grain, wheat and barley. In the maize group were two civilizations. A. The Andean Civilization, which began about 1500 BC, culminated in the Incan Empire, and was destroyed by outside invaders about AD 1600. B. The Mesoamerican Civilization, which began about 1000 BC, culminated in the Aztec Empire and was destroyed by similar invaders about A.D. 1550. Both of these civilizations were derived from a common source, a producing society which was not a civilization, probably situated in some hilly area in the northern part of South America. The rice group is somewhat misnamed, since the chief carbohydrates which supported it in the earliest period and have continued to be used since were millet and wheat. This group has at least three, and perhaps as many as six, civilizations in it. Only an expert on the history of the Far East could speak with confidence on this subject. Since this is not one of our chief areas of interest, we shall oversimplify the situation by listing no more than three civilizations. Of these, the earliest, Cynic civilization, rose in the valley of the Yellow River after 2000 BC, culminated in the Qin and Han empires after 250 BC, and was largely disrupted by Ural-Altic invaders after AD 400. From the debris of the Cynic civilization, there emerged two other civilizations. A. Chinese civilization, which began about A.D. 400, culminated in the Manchu Empire after 1644 and was destroyed by European intruders in the period 1790 to 1930. And B. Japanese civilization, which began about the time of Christ or a little earlier, culminated in the Tokugawa Empire after 1600 and may have been completely disrupted by Western intruders in the century following 1853. 
The earliest civilizations are to be found neither in the maize group nor in the rice group, but in the much more important group of grain civilizations. This group is more important not only because it contains the first civilizations to come into existence, but also because it contains such a large number of civilizations, seventeen at least. The earliest civilizations were derived from a number of closely related producing societies that we shall call the Neolithic Garden Cultures, or, less accurately, the Painted Pottery Peoples. The latter were the first peoples to have agriculture, and thus formed the earliest producing societies in history. At the risk of considerable oversimplification, we might say that these earliest agriculturists appeared in the hilly terrain of Western Asia, probably not far from Armenia, about 9,000 years ago. Because they knew nothing about replenishing the fertility of the soil, they practiced shifting cultivation, moving to new fields when yields declined in their old fields. In consequence, they expanded steadily, reaching Denmark and Britain in the west and China in the east before 2000 BC. That is to say, within 5,000 years, in the course of this movement, they found in various alluvial river valleys sites adapted to permanent large-scale settlement because in such valleys the annual flood replenished the fertility of the soil by depositing a layer of fertile sediment and accordingly the need for shifting cultivation ended and the possibility of permanent eventually urban settlements was offered this possibility was realized in four alluvial valleys of the old world in mesopotamia during the sixth millennium bc in the valley of the nile shortly afterward in the valley of the indus river early in the fourth millennium bc and in the huang ho valley of china late in the third millennium bc the last of these has already been mentioned as the source of the Cynic civilization, which was the parent of the Chinese, Japanese, and, probably, other Far Eastern civilizations. The first civilization known to us as the Sumerian or Mesopotamian civilization began after 6000 BC, reached a peak of achievement about 1700 BC, and ended in a series of empires, of which the last was the Persian. That empire, and the civilization of which it was the political aspect, were destroyed by outside invaders, the Greeks, under Alexander the Great, after the end of the fourth century. Parallel with this, a quite different civilization in the Nile Valley reached its peak about 2300 B.C., established its greatest geographic extent as the Egyptian Empire a millennium later, and was destroyed by the same Greek invaders in the few generations following, 330 BC. While this was going on, other civilizations appeared, flourished, culminated in their respective empires, and perished at the hands of outside invaders in a strikingly similar process. In the Indus Valley, the Indies civilization began about 3,500 B.C., reached a peak of achievement about 2,200 B.C., culminated in a political empire that we might call the Harappa Empire, and was destroyed by the Aryan invaders who came into the Indian subcontinent from the northwest about 1,700 B.C. From the wreckage of this culture, there was constructed a quite distinct civilization, which we may call Hindu. This reached a peak of achievement about 100 BC, and culminated in a series of empires, of which the last, called the Mughal Empire, was established early in the 16th century. This empire and civilization of which it formed a part were destroyed by European invaders in the centuries following 1700. From the wreckage of this Hindu civilization, a new civilization seems to be coming into existence in our own time. 
Returning to the Nearer East, we can see that a number of different civilizations appeared there, largely from Mesopotamian inspiration. On the island of Crete, the earliest civilization outside an alluvial valley began to form toward the end of the 4th millennium BC. It reached its peak in the Minoan period, about 1500 BC, and ended with the Mycenaean Empire, destroyed by the Dorian invaders in the 12th century BC. In Anatolia, in the 2nd millennium BC, rose and fell the shortest lived of all civilizations, known as the Hittite civilization. This had its beginnings after 2000 BC, reached its widest imperial extent about 1300, and perished a few generations later from the onslaughts of invading Iron Age intruders, cousins of the Dorians, who were simultaneously destroying Cretan civilization. In the Levant, during the same period, there appeared, under Mesopotamian stimulus, a civilization we might call Canaanite. Beginning before 2000 BC, it reached its greatest extent from the Red Sea to Spain, about 900 BC, and ended with that empire which, called Punic by the Romans and Carthaginian by us, was known to themselves more accurately as Canaanite. It perished from Roman invasion before 100 BC. From the wreckage of Cretan civilization, there began to grow, about 1000 BC, a new civilization, with which we are well acquainted, known as classical civilization, or Mediterranean civilization, from the sea whose shores it occupied. It reached its greatest peak in the century divided at 400 BC, and finally culminated in the Roman Empire. It was destroyed, as is generally known, by the Germanic barbarian invaders in the 5th century of our era. From its wreckage emerged three civilizations, a Western civilization, which may culminate in an American empire, b Orthodox civilization, which seems to be culminating in the Soviet Empire, and C. Islamic Civilization, which did culminate in the Ottoman Empire, and was disrupted by intruders from Western Civilization in the first half of the present century. In this enumeration, we have named sixteen civilizations. Of these, two existed in the New World three in the Far East, one in Africa, and the others in the rest of Eurasia. With careful study, it would be possible to distinguish approximately eight more civilizations divided about equally between the Near East and the Far East. We refrain from attempting to do this because the facts are not clear, and any conclusions would be disputable. The Near East and the Far East, in the history of civilizations, are like complex masses of quartz, from which numerous crystals protrude in various directions. The number of crystals in the mass might be disputed, and there would surely be disagreement about which portions of the main mass of quartz should be attributed to each crystal. It is possible that detailed study of the problem, like microscopic examination of the quartz, might help to solve this problem. But for our purpose, the task is not worth the effort. Just as it is possible for adjacent molecules in the quartz mass to be oriented in diverse directions so that they should, perhaps, be attributed to different crystals, so it is possible and indeed is well established, that individual persons living next to each other in, let us say, Palestine in the 13th century BC, should, from their personal orientations, be attributed to Hittite civilization, or to Egyptian civilization, or to Canaanite civilization, or even to Mesopotamian civilization. 
Such attribution of individuals to civilizations is no matter of any historical significance and need not concern us here. Nor need we worry at this time about the eight or more additional civilizations that have existed at various times in Ethiopia, Cambodia, Indonesia, or Tibet. Let us study the nature of civilizations as a scientist would study the nature of crystals, by examining the more clearly demarked and less controversial examples of our subject. Leaving aside for the moment the two civilizations found in the New World, we can arrange the fourteen Old World civilizations into a pattern to show their chief cultural connections. Many other connections, which we do not show on the diagram, exist in fact and can be inserted by the cognizant reader. It is to be noted that four of the earlier civilizations are cultural descendants of the Neolithic garden cultures, which were not themselves civilizations, since they lacked both writing and city life. In this diagram, the family tree of our own Western civilization, a lineage involving three generations between the Neolithic garden cultures and ourselves, has been marked with a double line. The meaning behind these lines and the other cultural connections shown on the diagram will be indicated later. For later reference, the following table gives the name approximate dates, the name of the culminating empire, and the outside intruders who terminated its existence for the sixteen civilizations mentioned. Name Mesopotamian Dates 6000 to 300 BC Empire Persian Invaders Greeks Name Egyptian Dates 5,500 to 300 B.C. Empire, Egyptian, Invaders, Greeks. Name, Indi, Dates, 3,500 to 1,500 B.C. Empire, Harappa, Invaders, Aryans. Name, Cretan, dates, 3000 to 1100 BC. Empire, Minoan, invaders, Dorians. Name, Cynic, dates, 2000 BC to AD 400. Empire, Han. Invaders, Huns. Name, Hittite. Dates, 1900 to 1000 BC. Empire, Hittite. Invaders, Phrygians. Name, Canaanite. Dates, 2200 to 100 BC. Empire, Punic, Invaders, Romans. Name, Classical, Dates, 1100 BC to AD 500. Empire, Roman, Invaders, Germans. Name, Mesoamerican, Dates, 1000 BC to AD 1550. Empire. Aztec. Invaders. Europeans. Name. Andean. Dates. 1500 BC to AD 1600. Empire. Inca. Invaders. Europeans. Name. Andean. Dates. 1500 B.C. to A.D. 1900. Empire. Mughal. 
invaders, Europeans. Name, Islamic. Dates, 600 to 1940. Empire, Ottoman. Invaders, Europeans. Name, Chinese. Dates, 400 to 1930. Empire, Manchu. Invaders, Europeans. Name, Japanese. Dates, 100 BC to AD 1950. Empire, Tokugawa. Invaders, Europeans. Name, Orthodox. Dates, 600 to the present. Empire, Soviet. Invaders. Question. Name, Western. Dates, 500 to the present. Empire. Question. Invaders. Question. If you enjoyed this recording, you can find more and support the production of these works at my website, johnloth.wordpress.com. That's www.johnloth.wordpress.com. Thanks for having a look and a listen. Your friend, John Loth.